Hi everyone and welcome to another session for Indulge Fest. My guest today is a very interesting man, chef, author, educator, consultant, public speaker, farm advocate, and most importantly, in every photograph you see, and even over the phone, he is the man with the smile. Chef Suvir Saran has three cookbooks to his name, and his fourth book, Instamatic, is a chef's deeper, more thoughtful look into today's Insta world. He has been a featured judge on Iron Chef and Next Iron Chef and is known for being what they call a breakout star on Top Chef Masters. If we must name restaurants, Suvir's Indian Home Cooking won the New York restaurant Devi a Michelin star. It was a first for Indian cuisine as well as a first for any non-French and non-Italian restaurant in North America. More recently, he has been with us in India, setting up the house of Celeste in Gurgaon. He is a truly busy man, so I'm privileged to have him with us today. Welcome, Suvir. Thank you for having me, Primrose, and I'm delighted to be part of the Femina series here. I love the magazine. As a young kid, I used to read it, and I love the energy that it brought to our four. So thank you. Thanks so much. So we're going to jump straight in. So we, this edition of Indulge Fest celebrates summer. Tell me what you think of summer in terms of food, in terms of life. Is it a good time for you? You know, I am. I love the winter. If you could put me in the Antarctic or the tundra, I'll be the happiest man on the planet. I'll be wearing nothing more than what I have on. Wow. And I'll be smiling the deepest smile. The summer and I have never been good friends. But after I came back to India after 28 years in New York City, I've now spent two summers in Delhi and I quite love them. And I, you know, everybody else is escaping India to go to lands afar. And for me, that's the magic that it, it was like New York City. The, a lot of people escaped New York in the summer for the mm. beach and for the mountains. And we had a farm in upstate New York where other New Yorkers were coming. And my partner and I would love going back into the city. When all the hooligans were away, we would be the rulers of the city and enjoy it. <laughs> so I think summer is exciting. For food, of course, so many amazing fruits and vegetables and the possibilities are endless, the herbs. And most of all, I think after that scorching heat and after being defeated by the weather, yeah. when you come back in and you're with friends and family at the table, food, conversations, they bring comfort and hope. So I think summer is exciting nonetheless. Yeah, you, you touched upon a lot of what I'm going to ask you in the next question. So seasonality, sustainability, organic, for you, these are much more than, you know, just buzzwords and they are a way of life. You've celebrated them at Devi. I know farm to fork is even more apt because you've lived years on your American masala farm. So tell us how this sort of ingredient forward and clean eating philosophy of yours came to be. You know, um, I think if you, when I left home at 20 and arrived in uh, New York City, being Indian was a dirty word, and it still remains. In the food world, being cooking Indian food is not the best thing you can do. It's like telling somebody, uh, you know, I'm an actor, but I uh, just do uh, Bollywood's uh, blog, you know, the super, super hit films. It's like there's no acting required. It's all about the cheapest thrill that you can give people. Yeah. And Indian food is that to the uh, non-Indian community. We've always been the cuisine that's up and coming, but it never makes it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's been that way because we Indians, we lose our mindful uh, thought process. Uh, you know, we, we are, Indians are deeply rooted in history, in culture, in tradition, in being a part of a global village. It's part of our heritage. But when it comes to cooking, we forget it. We, we get owned by butter chicken, dal makhani, yeah. paneer makhani, kebabs. We forget that our cuisine, our, the mother cuisine, which is a food cooked by our mothers and fathers, by our grandmothers and grandparents, by chefs in the families, by street food vendors who were cooking simple food. Yeah. That is the cuisine of India that should shine. But yeah. forever we've gone to this butter laden, fat laden, uh, gloppy, overspiced, unthinkable, unconscionable food that we've gone to at restaurants. And yeah. we've shown the world that face of India, which is ugly. It's not even Indian. It's, it was created in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. Yeah. The worst periods of food development for the world. And yeah. that's the zenith of Indian cooking to the world and to Indians. Yeah. So when I arrived in New York City, and that's what people thought India was, I realized I had to show them another face of India. I, I, I was one of those same kids that didn't eat, like eating veggies and all. But I grew up in a vegetarian home with a mother 
and a grandmother that were proud vegetarians that cooked a veritable feast with whether it wasn't about showing off the food was off the ground of the seasons of the community of the family uh, heirloom recipes and these were uh, buzzwords that people were excited to hear but in my case i was homesick for them they weren't buzzwords i was cooking like grandma would have wanted the chef to cook i was cooking like mother when she was without a cook she yeah. cooked because she was practical she had three kids to feed and to go to school to do her a bachelor b ed a uh, bachelor in education so she was a practical woman cooking practically for kids who were eating like an army so this <laughs> was inherently healthy seasonal regional localized everything that you want food to be and light and tasty and flavorful and delicious all at once so that's the food i brought out and as i brought it out i realized that it was cheap it was yummy it was heartwarming it was delightful to others the yeah. uh, review in the new york times said food so old it's fresh that wow. you know it was, i wasn't trying to do new tricks yeah. i was sharing the tricks of india and in sharing the tricks of india i was sustainable i was uh, seasonal i was regional i was telling a story and i was connecting it to the past while being mindfully present in today and that's the journey of sustainability that seduced me and from there i went into a farm we lived in a farm we, it was all organic but we didn't go for the label organic we had over 300 mouths of animals that we fed if they got sick we cared for them like we would our own parents and children so we were natural humane organic yep. without having labels wow. in the end labels mean nothing they are a way of people making money it's like organized religion it's yeah. about control yeah. if you're human beings and you're in tune to your own humanity if you see humanity in the other if you humanize another human being if you give a, another a uh, respect for life to another being with a breath and a conscience all of a sudden you're not an animal you become a being that is bigger than just the worst uh, creature we consider non uh, uh, good enough for us mm -hmm. and i think when you're conscientious you make better decisions when you make better decisions you're a better uh, uh, citizen of the planet and when you're that you're in sync with humanity and you live a better life have i sounded like a hippie And said, oh, amazing, amazing. But also, what I got from that, and I think which is very strong for you, is the whole family connection that you have. And I, I feel that food has come from there, and you know, um, has 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 family actually influenced so much. You talked of your grandmother, your mother cooking, and you know, bringing that. And I I know that you celebrate home cooking very very strongly, both in the restaurant as well as in your first book. So tell us a little about that as well. you know uh, we a child comes into this world because of a family uh, a family of a, a nation or a society raises the child the global family gives the child possibilities when any of these pieces are broken the child is broken and becomes a monster so the child coming into this world doesn't come with ideas doesn't come with yeah. preconceived notions doesn't come to hate doesn't come to bully doesn't come to eat a certain food this society the world the politics of the world the traditions the uh, culture they all inform this child to become the grown up person they become and so if you say you you know i didn't come out from a vacuum our yeah. family our relatives our friends the neighbors the teachers the gardeners at my school the chokidars at the gate the bus drivers the ayas at the swimming pool the uh, you know the, the street uh, vendors that would cross by the house selling different wares the kabadi wala the basuri wala they've all informed who i've become because in a one face i saw happiness another i saw a bro broken human i would question my mother and grandmother i would be given a lesson i they all taught me and if i can if i think that i've come out of a vacuum shame on me and so i think all of us as humans have to connect back to where we came from and when we do that we are of the universe we are not of e either a family or of an, a country we are of the world that is knitted together through uh, imf loans and uh, <laughs> nuclear deals we are all connected yeah. and when we realize that we are a human we are one and we learn that we tick together and you know the ncc song the uh, of the national cadet corps hum sab bhartiya hai जिसे बिखरे बिखरे तारे हैं हम लेकिन झिलमिल एक हैं दैट इन आर शिमरिंग टुगेदर वी आर द शाइनिंग गैलेक्सी ऑफ ब्रिलियंस इन आर ओन लिटिल ब्राइटनेस वी आर नथिंग सो आई थिंक दैट्स आई बिलीव इन दैट फर्मली साउंड्स 
Amazing. That was deep thought. Tell us a little about, I mean, this, this book of yours. I mean, since we're talking about deep thought, the last book that you've written. Yes. Tell us a little about how it this came out. Yeah. It's such a, such a striking uh, cover as well. So the cover is by a genius, Indian genius, uh, Freddie Birdie. Freddie Birdie designed the cover. He's a, he's a marketing, design, uh, advertising genius. In 2018, I suffered a mini stroke. And with that, uh, you know, I came to India, I had an iPhone. The iPhone had a camera. The camera would connect me to the planet ahead. And I would see the world in clarity, very close to my eyes. And even if I felt disconnected to life beyond a certain feet, because my eyes were weaker than they are today, I was uh, legally not able to see from one eye at all. And from the other eye, around three to six feet. So uh, for all purposes, I was legally blind. And the iPhone connected me to the world. And in connecting me to the world, uh, the world came literally close up to my face. And these photographs I would click to see where I was yeah. also made me question, made me question my identity, made me question my place in this world, made me find solace and comfort when the world around me was falling apart. And this book is about uh, around 75, 80 essays that are on life and living, on living and sharing, on sharing and caring, and caring and hoping. And that's what it is. It has a foreword from Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Yes. When he read it, called my mother and he said, this kid is a miracle. He said, I didn't expect anybody to write like this. And he told mom, this is old fashioned, strong literary writing that could be fodder for uh, uh, minds of tomorrow that will need nourishment. And he said, of course, I'll write a forward. And he wrote it. And he said, the pictures and word pictures paint uh, life lessons that can raise us to question our own being. And I was touched that, you know, that I hadn't thought about. I, I wrote a diary. This was my diary. Yeah. I've, I've taken thousands of photographs over that period. And I've written thousands of essays. These are 80 of those. And um, why did I share them? Because my... Uh, Francis Mays, the lady who wrote Under the Tuscan Sun, who just recently written uh, 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 another book on uh, Italy as a whole, Every Day in Italy. Mm. Francis read it and she would say that it's food for Proust. Then um, uh, another friend said to me that I write this book because it's feast for the eyes. My publisher, Yogi Suri, the publisher of Milap newspaper, mm. he said to me, so we, everybody should read this. It's a lessons in life. And I had five people call me, Francis, Yogi, and other friends, all in one day within a few hours. And I allowed Yogi to uh, take the book. And it was a labor of love and uh, a glossy book with glossy images. And uh, that's how it began. And the name Instamatic was given by Freddie Birdie. He was designing the cover and came up with the name. Because he said it's Insta moments, Insta thoughts, Insta wisdom. Yeah. And it's shot in the Insta world where we live for the moment. And I was living moment by moment. I, the world as I knew it in, in togetherness, in uh, the past, in uh, my mind had all disappeared. And I, all I had was this here and now. And if I moped in this here and now, I would have lost even that hope to live and fight. And so this book is about those instant moments that kept me going. So you, you came back to India and you've been here for a while and you you said that India got me back on my feet and that it has an infectious energy. So has India continued to sort of buoy you up through the lockdown? Has there been sort of new discovery, new happiness in this incredible. time? India is an incredible nation, perhaps the most brilliant nation that the uh, sun, moon and stars visit daily. And I think uh, it's mind boggling in its uh, Richness, it's mind boggling in its ugliness, it's mind boggling in its plurality, it's mind boggling in its discoveries, it's mind boggling in its humanity, it's uh, mind boggling in its animosity. So everything in India is exaggerated. Yeah, yeah. And yet, for the most part, we are able to remain a people united by our Indianness rather than our divisions. Yeah. And we are being tested again and again through history and we are in a very tough moment like the rest of the world. We are living in times that are polarizing across the planet, not just in India. Yeah. And I think hopefully if we are to survive, our humanity will make us survive. And Mother India has never stood for smallness. Bharat Mata, if there is any, is a very uh, multi-armed, multi-thinking, multi-loving, uh, uh, 
it, it, Mother India is plural. To me, Mother India is not about one people, one religion, one race. Mother India just welcomes all. I don't think there's another country that uh, can give any human being and every human being the warming, the warm welcome that India can afford them. The poor of India, a leper, a pauper, a, a, a person with no arms and limbs, the smile they give you when you, they see you on the street, even though you may be wearing a 10 carat bobble, they look at you with a smile, with welcome, not with hate and disdain. And that is India for you. That's the India that forever teaches me that no matter how challenged we feel, in India, there are others who are smiling and being graceful and gracious and magnanimous and generous and kind, despite all the vicissitudes of life being set their way. So when I look at those people, I realize how lucky and fortunate and um, easy I have it. So, you know, we, we, India teaches every day. India is an incredible teacher. Yes, and you, you actually, I mean, this is my next thing that I want to talk about. When we look through your social media posts, you come across as a man who celebrates every moment and who truly lives life. There's something very vivacious, very, you know, people will live vicariously and you pull them along. Have you always been like this? I mean, I'm, I, I feel that perhaps, perhaps you have been, but you know. I'm a, I'm a very private person in reality. But uh, people seem to enjoy being in my company and I find people boring. So uh, <laughs> I, I love reading, I love writing, I love singing, I love painting, I love knitting, I love uh, embroidery, I love sculpting, I love dressing, I love thinking, I love smiling, but alone. But when I'm uh, with people and people, I, I have a magnet, people just come to me. Uh, including children that I've never had of my own and I've never had a biological clock that's sticking to adopt kids or anything. They are, everybody's happy around me. But I feel I want to, I, I entertain because I'm bored. I indulge because I just want to keep myself busy. And so I think, um, yes, if the vivaciousness is there, it's an act that I've been very successfully pulling off. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm the happiest man when I'm alone. I could spend days reading a book. I could spend days singing one rag. I could spend days singing two lines of a khayal. I could spend uh, 24 months singing one ghazal. So you know, that's, I, 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 love, uh, I love the, uh, uh, I love sameness like every, all of us do, but I love, uh, I love reflecting alone, but I never get that comfort. And because I have people around me, I feel if I don't entertain them, they'll be doing things that I may not like. Yep. So I create, I create for others. So I know it's at least in the direction I want things to go. You have but, control. <laughs> but I, I, I let go because if you control, 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 yeah, then, then there's always going to be uh, uh, anger and sadness. I create, give all the tools that I love. You know, you give the colors and the uh, textures you want, and then you let people paint the canvas they paint. And I'm happy watching it. But I, truly, I'm a very private person. But, but on social media, I think what I've learned is my page may be different from a lot of others. Because if you see, I have other people coming and sharing with me. I don't control the narrative. Yeah. I have my chefs, my mentee, mentor, mentees that I mentor, mentor. I have a kid in France now sharing every Wednesday, a Mehul uh, Chajar, who is now every Wednesday giving us a recipe on my page. I don't have to own the, my, own, yeah. uh, my own story. My story is richer when I bring out the stories of others. Because as I said, I don't live in a vacuum. Yeah. So I'm comfortable sharing the stories of people that touch my life. And in doing so, I think I give others a more interesting page to look at. Because uh, they don't have just me, but they have all my people that enrich my world, enrich their lives. And I hope that's a fair thing to do because that's what keeps me interested in social media. It, if it was all about me, I'd be bored to death. I'm not that interested. <laughs> but other people would not be bored to death. But anyway, let us go into another interesting aspect. I can't resist talking about when we spoke offline, you talked about how Femina has been in your life and you spoke about it at the beginning for a very long time. You also spoke about school and how you were the only person who, only boy who took home economics, I think. Yeah. That's so interesting. So tell us a little about that. So I tell people that the kitchen was that... Um, comforting cave, the uh, space where I didn't feel judged, that I didn't feel I had to perform, that I didn't feel I had to be 
putting on a show. You know, I, I knew from the age of three that I was a different child. I think every kid knows that they are different, but society is always trying to fit us into boxes. If you're a boy, wear more blue, less pink and red. If you're a, a girl, you have to, you know, follow certain rules and you have to be dainty and pretty and all of whatever people want you to be. But kids come of age thinking something else in their head. And I came of age as a boy who didn't want to play cricket, who found other boys, uh, perhaps the same thing that other boys were finding girls to be. I've had attention with another man and uh, I didn't have vocabulary for it. I had no role models for it. So here I wanted to go hug a boy, but I knew it was taboo. And so I ran into the kitchen where our Panditji, the Maharaj in our kitchen, he would allow me to come sit with him and just peel vegetables. Mm. And he would tell me, he would tell me stories about, about our family of my grandmother's parents and her siblings and her, her grand and her grandmothers and grandfathers holding court in a, a little uh, principality called Kurwad near Lucknow where uh, the queen mother had brought in my great grandfather as the uh, court of wards. So he would tell us these stories and kept me entertained. And then when he would go rest in the afternoon, I would go along with him and he would be like, and then he would start reading the Gita and the Mahabharata and the Ramayan. And he taught me how to sing all these verses in meter. Chan, Chopai, Sorat. I know the tunes and meter for each of them. And how many Indian boys growing up at six, seven or eight years of age can recite a Gita by heart? I learned it all. So here, yeah, because I, and I felt very comfortable that he never mocked me, never judged me. And I didn't have any tension. If I'd gone out, perhaps the boys would have kicked me or shamed me or bullied me. But here I was with Panditji, I felt cool. There was femina lying around, I saw recipes in there, and I saw a language that was gentle, it wasn't too macho. So I think the connection of femina, the connection of food grounded me. So one day I told Mrs. Punia and Mrs. Bina Rana, the teacher who ran our meal planning and home economics department, it was sixth grade or seventh grade. I wanted to become a part of that curriculum and their, their class. And she said to me, can you, do you know anything? You can lay a table? I, and I showed them, they were shocked that I could make four napkins in a gazillion ways. I could cook better than the girls. I would sing, I would paint menus, I would embroider, I would make tablecloths, I would sew them, I would I knew all of it. And so they allowed me. The next thing I knew I was teaching macrame in school as a teacher because macrame teacher's husband had something happen, she had to leave school. So I became a craft teacher in our school and I would teach craft classes to kids sixth through 10th they would come in two periods every day. I would be pulled out of my class to teach other kids macrame. So, you know, our school, modern school, Vasant Bihar, was a phenomenal school where the teachers never challenged me to do things that were unconventional. In 11th and 12th, kids take five subjects, physics, biology, chemistry, math, and English, if you are a, a science student. I took all of those because I wanted to either be a doctor or an artist. And then I took music, Hindi, and uh, the arts. So I was going in a painting room for a period and I would go to a Hindi class and then I would go to music class. I got a hundred on hundred in arts. I got a 97 in music and I couldn't give the Hindi exam because it was conflicting with one of the other subjects. But never in the history of modern school had a student taken eight subjects in 12th wow. grade. And I don't think even today anybody would because it's a recipe in disaster, too much work. <laughs> but I did it, the school allowed, I would have to bunk every day at least four or five classes to take these other three subjects. And the school principal and the teachers never challenged. They were uh, incredible support. They were, they knew this kid is different, but he has, he's not doing drugs. He's not being a bully. He's not uh, zipping things apart. He's studying, he's learning other subjects. They never stopped me. So I owe all of them and the magazine Femina, uh, a lot of comfort, support, uh, discovery, uh, but thinking that I learned to do at a young age, I owe to all of you and to these teachers and my school and my elders, my parents, my neighbors. They never judged. That's amazing. I was a lucky boy. I lived in a bubble. A very big bubble because the bubble was full of people that were kind and generous. No, you, you are very much the half full glass person. So, I mean, it's, it's a privilege to listen to that. Uh, let's go back a little to food. You're very much about the comfort of Indian food, the reinventing of classics, but you've also spoken of re of creating new Indian classics. And I know that goes uh, with your dislike, perhaps, of all the heavy butter chickens and the this and the that. 
So what, what sort of things has that led to in your restaurants? And what do you think summer 2021 will bring in terms of this, you know, Indian food, classic, new, different? So I think, you know, uh, I, uh, yes, to me, the new, I don't, um, I cooked Indian food with a personality. I cooked, uh, you know, when we opened Devi, there wasn't another restaurant in the planet that had a tasting menu. There was no other chef putting on one plate five items that were dishes that were five dishes on their own, but putting the plating them together, nobody had done it. And then all of a sudden there were 51 versions of what they had done across London and India. But uh, my mother would love it. She said, you know, uh, if somebody copies you, that's the most flattering way of uh, giving a nod to you. And uh, I said, mom, I have copied all of you. So there's no, there's no arrogance here that should tell us that uh, somebody is copying me. We've all come from being sponges. Life, when we eat, when we travel, when we eat out with friends and family, when we eat at a railway station, when we eat in an aircraft, when we eat at a, uh, in a ship, in a cruise, all those meals are in our head. And when we create, we are stealing from those ideas and creating our own versions. So it's all connected. So we created, you know, there was a, a my version of Gobi Manchurian uh, is not that gloppy, goopy, soupy dish that Indians seem to love. Mine is crispy, crunchy, sweet, sticky, hot, um, um, ketchupy, and comforting all at once. So Indians and non-Indians fell in love with it. In the, at the New York Times website, it may be the number one most favorite dish of Sam Sifton, the food editor. He makes it again and again. And Indians and non-Indians in America cannot get enough of it. We would sell it for $18 when we first opened, where for $18 in other restaurants, you could get a meat dish. And we were selling a tiny portion of five or six heads of cauliflower. But I could demand that because I knew nobody Indian would be making it that perfectly. That crisp, crunchy, sweet, sticky, spicy, hot, and with green spring onions uh, sliced onto it. And it was fresh, it was uh, spicy, it was hot, it was comforting. That became an iconic dish. I made a crispy okra salad that I've been make, I used to make since the age of nine in Delhi. Okra cut it lengthwise. Mm -hmm. The other chefs who are now making karari bhindi weren't cooking when they were kids. Mm -hmm. From the age of five, I've been cooking. So I used to cut, cut okra long from the age of eight. And I used to make this salad of okra, which was crispy with onions, tomatoes, chaat masala and nimbu, with dhania and mint put into it, and a little uh, uh, amchur. And I made it in New York and put it on the menu. We would charge $21 for a small, tiny bowl. When Food & Wine magazine in 2018 came out with their 40th anniversary edition, this is the most reputable magazine of the world for food. Yes. They did their 40th anniversary edition. They took 40 chefs, 40 dishes from uh, 40 parts of the world. Mm. The only recipe from South Asia is my karari bhindi and the only she Indian chef featured in it. And they called it the 40 most iconic recipes of the last 40 years. Oh, so again, I owe it to India. I didn't do anything new, but I would look at Indian food and say if I were Indian living in the 21st century, how would I make an 18th century dish? To be authentic, one of the Chinese scholars I'd read said, to be authentic to any moment in time or a, a thing in time, you have to first be authentic to this moment in time. Yep. You have to be connected to this here and now and have respect for the past and be thinking of the future and what practices you must employ to maintain a future. So you have to be sustainable for tomorrow. You have to be giving respect to yesterday yeah. and be living wholly today. So that's the philosophy I would bring to the table. And that's always guided me. And I think the pandemic has given us a unique opportunity in the Indian landscape, just like all over the world, that the world has shown us that we were broken, we were failing, we were li living debaucherous, mindless lives that had to be uh, uh, having a halt. Mm -hmm. And now that we've, we've been given this stop sign that's looking at our face even now, it's upon us, incumbent upon us to think, to reflect and create new tomorrows. And with that, we must create new recipes that will be fulfilling and mindfully delicious and hopefully the new butter chickens and dal makhnis of tomorrow. And I think this summer will be a test of who the real men and women are that are human, are smart and will be the heroes of tomorrow. And if we still do the same that we were doing before the pandemic, shame on us. Yes. But I think a lot of people, a lot in the food industry, as well as other industries, will hopefully rise to the challenge of the pandemic occasion and do the right and needful today.
So I think the summer will be very exciting in Sri Lanka. Which brings me to my last question or talking point. You are very much here and now. You are very much reflecting on the past, looking at the future. So what does the future, do you think, what is the future for Suveer Saran, the chef, the man? What, what do you think it brings? What are you looking forward to? I think India has brought the man to the front. The chef has been put to the back. The man is learning to be human. The man is uh, learning to be grounded. The man is learning to be civilized. The man is learning to be a person who sees humanity in the other as he sees in himself. The man is learning to uh, protect the world around him so that he can be protected by it. And the man is realizing that uh, time is a gift that isn't a promise, but uh, is a miracle that we have uh, been gifted. So if we hold on to it, if we get the most out of it with the most respect given to it, it can be a gift we can share with the others that come after us. And when we do it mindfully, when we do it with dignity and with grace, those others that come after us may remember us more fondly than they would if we don't. So that man is hoping that he is relevant tomorrow, not for the stars and the accolades that the food industry has given him, but for the uh, uh, decency, empathy, acceptance, the celebration of uh, uh, diversity, plurality, of uh, 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 identities other than his own, that that man uh, is able to shine today, tomorrow, and day after. And perhaps as I leave this planet, people will cry that a good human being was lost, not just a chef. And the chef hopes to ride the coattails of this man and continue to mentor uh, young generations, uh, next generations of chefs, and teach them to challenge the status quo with me and even uh, despite me, and create uh, winning uh, restaurants and winning dishes that will feed people with love and hope and discovery tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. And if they become the rising star chefs of tomorrow, I'll be able to say that for that one flash in their 20s, I knew them and I was able to touch their life and give them some hope to do the right thing. So that's what the man and the chef are hoping. That is, um, uh, he can be part of. That was amazing. Thank you, Suveer. That has been such an interesting, invigorating discussion. I think we've learned so much about you. You've been so honest. You've sort of laid yourself so bare and it's been such a great privilege. Thank you so very much. All the very best. And of course, you must keep smiling. It's that smile that, that really lights up everything. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Primrose. And thank you to Femina for doing what you all do. And I hope women are given more and more space in our restaurant industry. The one thing that I have done, and I hope I can do better this year and in the years forward, is to ensure safe working space for women in our industry, for minorities. And women have always fought the hardest and smartest battles for uh, other minorities and themselves. And the world isn't a fair place. And I hope that uh, women listening to me and us, and that the readers of the magazine, Remember that the fight and struggle of women is far from over and that every woman watching us is uh, uh, mindful of knowing that their man, their husband, their father, their child, their son, their son-in-law also shares equal blame for what, the, what goes around to women, happens to women around them. So I think as mothers, as sisters, as uh, daughters, we must challenge the men in our lives to make sure they're not repeating the same horrors that women are, uh, have to face every day, that I think uh, the struggle is far from over. And I thank Femina for uh, putting uh, women's lives front and center in the Indian uh, landscape. And I love that about the magazine because I was so young, young nation in the 70s, coming of age. I, I was proud that when I arrived in New York City, when I saw Ms. Magazine, I already knew Femina. So I wasn't ashamed yeah. that my nation didn't have a magazine. So I'm very proud of all of you and thank you for giving uh, uh, me the uh, chance to be with you all, but I hope you all keep sharing more and more stories of empowerment for women. We need a lot more women in all our uh, jobs, in all industries. And the restaurant industry is shamefully uh, not a good place for women, and I hope that changes. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.
take care.